This is an eight iron and it's a dead shank. Wow. Way right. Oh, Take that shank. off the paddle. You gotta be kidding me. Very tough pitch shot right here. You gotta hit it into the hill. One hop up and bite and it's in. Kind of like that. I would like to welcome James Nitties to the Sub-70 Podcast, a two-time winner on the Austral Asian Tour, Corn Ferry Tour winner, and arguably, maybe Gary McCord would be a tough uh, toss-up here, but could be one of the best mustaches in the game of golf. So it's an honor. Been looking forward to having you on for a while. Really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for coming on. Great to be here. I definitely haven't had an intro through my mustache before so uh pretty proud of that one well i mean golf wins on major tours and a great mustache i don't know if it gets any better than that so we don't got to throw the props out at you pro you know that's how it works um first off i heard well the mustache must have worked because you are now engaged so apparently mustaches still attract beautiful women so congratulations on that uh thank you yes she said yes after uh waiting for around six and a half years so not sure if that's a mistake on her part, but uh, nonetheless, it was quite an exciting, exciting weekend. And I'm a little dusty today uh, through some some waves of celebration. So uh, it all worked out. Well, congratulations. Uh, you know, you're doing something right if she waited six years plus. I, I lasted about three years before I ended up being my wife was like, oh, what, are you, what are we doing here? So, I mean, I give you props for lasting that long. So, you know. It, you put up a good fight, though. The three years is still still honorable. Yeah, I would agree, right? It's not like, you know, six months into it and she's winning completely. I mean, she wins in everything pretty much now, but I did last the three years of, you know, going out three nights a week and playing golf all the time before we got married, before she was like, are you going to eventually grow up and follow through with this? So, yeah, I had a good run. I, mean, I can't complain, right? I mean, three <laughs> nice, years. nice three, work. <laughs> yeah, three years was acceptable. Um yeah, so congratulations, man. It's good. That's good. It, being married is a great thing, and um, I'm happy for you. So well done, sir. Thanks very much. Now is uh, she's a good girl, so I was I was pretty pretty happy. Well, let's talk some uh, some golf for uh, 2022. Are you going to be focusing more on broadcasting media side, or is the desire still there to to try to work your way back onto the PGA Tour? you know, with some, maybe some corn fairy tour starts or, you know, where, where are you sort of at in that portion of your career at this point? Kind of, uh, for me, it's kind of up in the air at the moment. Um, it just really all comes down to the bank balance. So, um, last year I kind of run out of money, uh, chased, I had limited status on the corn fairy tour. So I, I chased around about 10 qualifiers, did some PGA tour stuff, um, did some state opens and mini tour stuff. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I really love, I love competing. I don't want to give golf away, but I had this opportunity where I did kind of a test for, um, Corn Ferry Tour, um, event for broadcasting where they were using pretty much the same sort of technology as PGA Tour Live does. And I think next year they want to go and maybe broadcast some Corn Ferry Tour events. And they called me up to do it because, uh, you know, I've been still been playing and, banging around the mini tours and and I know a lot of the guys that are um you know on the corn free tour and or trying to get onto the PGA tour because I've just been playing with them over the past five years so I, I it was a pretty good experience for me um I I enjoyed it thoroughly and loved doing broadcasting um, you know just being around the game is is fun um so for next year uh i kind of might have some opportunity with PGA Tour Live, which just got bought by SBM Plus. And um, so I'll be doing some some broadcasting for some some of the tour events, um, a couple like Pebble and Waste Management and, you know, Bay Hill. So I thought, you know, for the, the fact that they offered me those and I'm, I've got the experience of a, a newborn chicken was, uh, was, was pretty good. So I couldn't really say no to that because I love doing it. But... Um, I suppose to what the future holds is I think what whatever happens dictates what I'll do. So if I get a great opportunity through broadcasting and, you know, and I'm, you know, I get better at it and I get more experienced and I'm, I'm having fun, I wouldn't mind going in that route, but I also kind of want to compete on the side. So 
you know, it's just whatever time permits. And my my lovely fiance, if she still allows me to leave the house for the whole year and go chase my golf dream, and which she will, she said she would, and uh, and I get to do some broadcasting on the side. So yeah, I didn't give you a really straight answer, but I I think I'm going to do about some some broadcasting, and if if my calendar opens up, I would love to still try to play some golf. So that's about it. On the broadcasting side, are they having you in a tower or are you going to be out walking with the groups? So for me personally, I'll be in in the tower, but I won't be at the event. So I'll be doing um, PJ Tour Live Studios are in St. Augustine, Florida. So I'll be not at the tournament, but, you know, like we, the amount of, the amount of uh, research that the, the team does and the amount of notes you have, it's like an encyclopedia. So, it's almost you know you, you're you're inundated with all this information on every player in the field, and um, the way PGA to a live works is you know they uh, they follow like two groups and a, and a certain hole, so you've got all this information, and you know I'll have yardage books, and then we will have a guy um, that'll be at the course. Either two guys will will be all girls will be walking scorers at the golf course, so. Oh, sorry, walking uh, commentators at the golf course. So, yeah, I'll be kind of analyst in the booth. Is it harder than you think to make it sound effortless? Because there's somebody in your ear as well, right? So then is the tough part what to say, what not to say, not to over-talk, not to under-talk? Is it a weird flow to kind of get that going at first, or did it come pretty quick to you of, oh, hey, I've been there. I've seen what this player's doing. Been there, done that. I've been trying to grind out a Friday round to make the cut. I'm just going to let my stream of consciousness go here and talk. Like, how is that? How hard is that learning curve uh, where, like, the producers are happy with what you're doing? Yeah, it's super. It's difficult. Um, So, the reason I had kind of an opportunity to do some broadcasting is back in like 2014, I was playing on the Corn Ferry Tour and um, I missed the cut. And I think um, one of their usual broadcasters um, couldn't make the event. And uh, it was in Nova Scotia in uh, Canada. And they said, well, hey, you know, are you, do you want to do some, you know, walking score, uh, walking broadcasting for the next two days? And I was like, yeah, that'd be fun. You know, throw me in there. I'll, I'll be a bit of a larrikin, make some funny comments. So... I did that for two days and the producer was like, Hey, you know, you're really good. Do you want to, um, you know, you've, you've got an opportunity anytime you want it. And obviously I was still, you know, I had full status on the corn Ferry tour for a couple of years and, and I, I wasn't ready to, you know, do that sort of stuff. So, but then the number one thing that was so difficult was being the, the walking uh, broadcaster, and because they, you know, it, it was a corn free tour, so it wasn't a big production like the PGA Tour where they've got cameras on every single hole. Um, so you had to call a lot of shots off tape. And to call a shot off tape, and they, they still would, you know, if you're watching coverage on the PGA Tour or CBS or Golf Channel, they would have a lot of people calling shots where it's already been hit. So as the, the walking broadcaster, you've seen the shot, you know what, what the result is but you need to call it like you haven't seen it before. So, mm-hmm. you know, you'll be over the, um, you know, the, the producer will be in your ear and he'll be like, all right, he's over the ball. He's about, he's waggling. He's about to take the club away and you're calling it like, so while the producer's in your ear saying these things, you're saying, all right, he's got 150 yards. The wind's off the right a little bit. And then the producer will be like, all right, action. So that means he, he takes the club away, and then, and then he'll say contact, and you're like, all right. So while he's saying all this in your ear, you're comment, commentating like you're watching the golf shot, and so yeah, it's quite difficult because you know you, it's hard to talk when someone's talking over you in your ear, and and then you and then you have to act like you haven't seen where the ball went. So it's it's kind of difficult, but me personally, being in the booth. Um, and being an analyst, it's a lot easier to just talk about what you see as a player. You don't, you know, hosting's a lot different because you need to cut to commercial, you need to name sponsors, remember a lot of information. But as an, an analyst, you're kind of just a golfer 
calling calling what you see, what you would like to hear, and try not to over talk. So yeah, that's that's kind of it. It's difficult, but it's kind of fun at the same time. Do they have you doing swing analysis and stuff like that as well, where they want you to break down this player's swing, what's going on, what your thoughts are, that kind of stuff as well? Yeah, so uh, swing analysis um, on a couple different guys, which that's, for me personally, that's my, I'm not great at swing analysis, so I really want to get better at that because I'm kind of a field player myself. Um, you know, I never watched a lot of film on my own golf swing and it's uh, I didn't really, it wasn't really technical, so... You know, being able to, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot better at calling shots like through result, like uh, being spontaneous, trying to be witty, come up with different stuff like that. But that's just one part of the job where I'm like, all right, well, I got to get better at this. So I've been studying a little bit and watching a lot of golf swings, and you know, watching different players' tendencies and how athletic different guys are. So, but. I also want to put my own spin on it and make it a little bit entertaining for people at home, you know, because broadcasting's got a little bit dull and it's a lot of recycled information and recycled sayings. And I kind of want to, you know, like at the end of the day, no one really is listening to the broadcaster. You're kind of just background um, noise for someone that's watching golf. So you never... Another tip that I got is never over talk. So that if there's some dead air or you hear the caddy talking to his player, just fade out because people want to hear what the, the players have to say way more than they do the broadcast. And they want to hear what the caddy conversation is like if it's a high pressure situation. So, you know, it's it, the producers, the, that was a good tip that I got. They're like, look, you don't have to talk all the time. Dead air is not bad air. It's, you know, it's better than just flooding it with words. So, yeah, for me, it's just about being kind of authentic and fun and entertaining, you know, without being overbearing and, and too kind of like broadcastery. Yeah, and I think like sometimes you watch the European tour feed and they've got like a sometimes, you know, the great voice of like Sam Torrance. It's just and there's some silence and he just lets the shot speak and it's great, right? Like those guys seem to have. I actually enjoy their feed a little bit more than like CBS for the most part. Like it's just. I don't know. It's more like Sam just talking or the European tour guys seem to do a great job of letting sometimes silence work. One, one, hundred percent. Yeah, you're correct. It's um, sometimes when I'm watching the U the U S coverage, I feel like there's 17 people in the broadcasting booth, you know? So everyone's like chiming in trying to put their two cents in. And I was like, dude, just let, let the guy, you know, I want to hear the sound of the shot. I want to hear the reaction of the play. You know, you don't have to, as soon as he makes contact, say, well, he didn't look like he was too comfortable. You know, like it's, it, there is an element and a, a satisfaction to just hearing the guy hit the shot and and even hearing the ball hit the green and, and, and the result of the shot before someone is kind of chiming in and saying what he did wrong, you know? Yeah, and then if it comes, you know, those guys do, I think, a really good job of then if there's a comment that needs to be said, and sometimes there's no comment, and they just go to the next shot, right? And, and I think the viewer understands when the guy's head's down and he hit a shitty shot and it's out to the right, and, I mean, it speaks for itself, and they're just kind of moving on. I, I, I agree with you, and I think American broadcasting, I'm you're making my job easy here because this was the next topic I was going to bring up. I think it is missing, uh, maybe if you're like, I don't know, I'm 48, and I feel like I'm the younger demographic of it, though, but it just feels stale and old. Like, I love what Colt is doing, and I want to listen to the guys give each other shit more back and forth like you're playing at the club. And, yes, we want your expertise because you've won at the highest level. You competed at the highest level. But I also don't want it to be so damn corporate. And I think, like, Colt's doing a great job with it. Um, you know, I don't know what your thoughts are on it. And Matt, you know, bringing Matt Every in, right? Like, I know you knew him from the big break, but like that guy will be awesome, right? Like he'll say anything. If somebody hits a shit shot, he's just going to say, that was terrible, right? Like he's just going to call it out like he would on his own game. I mean, that's his personality. So I'm, I think there's a little bit of a sea change coming. Um, maybe with some, you know, more interesting characters to do some broadcasting. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's, yeah, Colt's great. Um, he, he does it as much as he can without like, you know, cause CBS, I feel like, I don't know by experience, but I feel like CBS is kind of a little, as you say, corporate professional. So 
Colt, I think he he's grabbing as much of the rope as he possibly can without like you know going across the line of where he probably wants to go with where he would be like with his buddies and because Colt's one of the biggest trash talkers. Like I I grew up, um, he lived in Dallas um, for the first uh, I think I because I moved to Dallas in Texas um, 2009. So I, I used to play a fair bit with Colt. He he moved out to Arizona probably about three or four years ago, and um, I like he was next level when it came to trash talking. But he's also you know Colt's is, aesthetically he's not like the the he doesn't have the best swing. He doesn't hit it the longest. He's not you know like he was just a really good golfer and gambler at the same time. And he knew his ability could back himself up so much that he could he could trash talk with the best of them. So if they gave him, you know, a long leash and on CBS, he, he would, he would dead set throw some words around for sure. But that's why he does such a great job with, you know, with the, the channel that he's on. And yeah, I saw, um, I know Matt, Matt every pretty well, you know, like, I mean, we don't talk every week or anything, but we send occasional text message and he's buddies with a lot of my friends in, um, out in uh, Ponte Vedra, out of Jacksonville, and he plays with guys like Cam Smith a lot, Aaron Price, um, fair few Aussies out there. So, and uh, yeah, everyone knows how uh, unhinged every can get on the golf course, <laughs> and it's you know it's pure entertainment. So, if he just refines, you know, because every's not like he's not the biggest larrikin, like he's not the um, you know he's he's not a loud guy, and he's not a but but if he can combine. Getting refining his like kind of broadcaster talent with to go along with like how you know not hot headed but how like up and down his you know his his attitude on the golf course was oh he he he's going to be gold so it is great that it's kind of a changing of the guard and I think they know this like it is getting a little stagnant like you watch you've had all the same guys on CBS and um, Golf Channel for years and it's like you know it. it 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 just needs the the way streaming and the way broadcasting and the way even content is consumed now, like it's just younger. So I think when you know ESPN just took over PGA to Alive and and I, I I I'm going to learn this, but I'm I think they want to move in kind of a younger direction. And, and and I'm not talking about age. I'm just talking about how people consume what they're watching. So. I think it's like because I, I saw a stat the other day. ESPN Plus is like their their average like subscriber age is something like thirty seven to seventeen. So it's like a yeah. it's like a younger demographic, and and you you want to make something entertaining. Like you know, it doesn't want to just be like you know too. You don't want to go too too one way because you're still trying to drag a lot of viewership um, from the the bigger channels and corporations. So. And but then you also want to combine all the ES, ESPN Plus and all the streaming kind of um, you know kids and adults that that are coming from like ESPN. So it's I think it's cool because I because I went in there the first time I I got asked to do it a couple of months ago and I'm like well how do you want me to sound I can sound like I can talk perfect and be like really broadcastery or I can be kind of edgy and you know say what I'm thinking a lot of the time and you know, just kind of dress it up a little bit. And um, it was Alex Baldwin, who's the, she's like the top of the Corn Ferry Tour right now. And she's like, hey, I want this to be fun. I want you to have an identity. I want you, you know, like just just, just go and have a good time. And I was like, I thought that was really cool because that's, that's a good direction for the Corn Ferry Tour to be going in where she, you know, they're trying to get into that kind of streaming service kind of arena and if if that's the attitude that she's got, where she wants to make it kind of young and fun, and I think they're kind of in good hands with her. So I would I look I'm I'm so wet behind the ears of of broadcasting, but I really love the way that they're kind of trying to go with guys like Colt and Matt, where we could we could possibly get like a couple guys just talking shit on TV, right. and uh, you know everyone back at home is be like, oh, that's what I say to my buddy when he misses a four footer, or you know, without without being um, critic too critical of the players, because obviously, hey, they're on the PGA tour, and I'm sitting in the booth talking about it. So um, I think you're right. Yeah, it, it, I want to if I like get into the space full time, which I'm trying to do. 
I would definitely want to go in that direction where not over the top, like not, you know, you kind of like a Faraday still has it. Like Dave Faraday is still, he's still as long as he's been in the game for, he's still pretty cheeky and sarcastic and without, but then he knows how to like button it up when he's like interviewing like Jack Nicholas or, you know, yeah. like when, when he had Tiger on the other day where it's, you know, you know the, what your viewership is. So there's a couple of guys that still have it and are still true pro- professionals, but you're right. It, it's, it's gotten a little mundane over like the past sort of five years. Well, and I think with like Matt, like I think every golfer who loves golf, like gets him where it's like, he's won like twice on the PGA tour, but he'll like go miscut, miscut, hate golf, F this, get me to the parking lot, win. And it's like, I think you totally get, like people would understand the love hate relationship with this great game where like some days you're just like, why do I do this to myself? dear God, get me out of here, to I'm the best player in the world, right, in your own mind of, like, I'm playing so good right now. And it can all happen in the space of, like, two weeks. And to me, like, that's Matt Every. But he, like, shows the emotion of it. So it's like, I get where that dude's coming from. I mean, like I said, I think if he gets it right, he could be really, really fun because he's, I'm assuming, and I don't know him, but he looks like he loves golf and hates golf at the same time. It could happen maybe in the one round of golf in his own world. Well, yeah, 100%. And that's the thing with every, like, the the iconic the iconic uh, picture of him, like, he, I think he's got a clothing brand out. It's called LFG it's or something. And, yeah, but, he's uh, doing the club. Yeah, and it's him, that's the iconic photo of, I think he's throwing a wedge in that, but there's a, there's another iconic story about him where he's, he, he launched his putter into a lake that about 200 yards away after he just shot, like, 27 for nine holes. So it's like... Yeah, you get it when people are playing bad and they throw their clubs. This guy's emotions, like Every's emotions are so high and low that he just helicoptered his putter after he didn't make like seven birdies in a row or something. So it's like, you know, it's it's perfect. It's a good position, I think, to get guys like him, um, you know, involved in, in that type of... The, the, like, for me personally, I, if I was him, I, I'd be still playing. Like, he's... He's I mean, good. he's he's set and he's still really good. Could win at any time, and but I think for him personally, it's just it's the emotion. It's and I don't think he wants to go back to Corn Ferry Tour. I don't think he he wants to do the grind of you know going down another level. So yeah, I think I think I heard him on um, another podcast and he was talking about yeah he might play six or seven events if he gets them on tour next year. But uh, yeah, he lo- and also looks like he wants to get into the broadcasting field. So I'd I'd love to be, you know, because he I think he did some on course stuff. So I think it'd be amazing. I'd I'd be super excited if I was uh, in the booth and throwing it down to him at the golf course and and just riffing back and forth. That'd be exactly fun. right. He'd be perfect for that. Yeah, and I think golf's going that way, right? Like. Our club, you know, it's definitely, you know, five years ago, the old guys were like, no music. And now it's like, even it's a private club. It's like, now there's music and, you know, I'm wearing a hoodie with a flat bill and Pumas and playing. And like, I don't know, you know, it's changing, which I think is for the good. It's just a little bit more chill. You know what I mean? And I, yeah. And that's that's good. And it's, it's because you're getting a lot more younger males playing the game. It's like. You know, yeah, kids always get into the sport and you've got the older generation that's always played the sport. But I think you're really, you're getting a lot of like 30 to 40 year old um, guys that always thought golf was kind of like not cool that are that are coming into the game and they're bringing their swagger a little bit. And now they're, and because golf is, it's like anyone, like I, I used to get teased and bullied at school for, for playing golf. And now all those guys that used to give me shit they're all obsessed with golf as like 40 year olds. They're like, Oh, it's the best game ever. You know, like you can't, once you get into golf and you get addicted and it's funny cause you see all these memes on online where like girls, even like girls off Tinder or all the dating websites, they're all meeting these guys that are like obsessed with golf and golf's like their new kind of, uh, girlfriend as soon as, you know, like all these girls are getting super jealous cause all these guys are getting into golf and they're all men, you know? So it's like, you're going to bring that that target market to the game. And what comes with that is guys that enjoy having a beer and a laugh and a cigar and, and then 
also, you know, wearing hoodies and just because that's the culture of of that age group that's that's come up, you know, now they're getting into golf opposed to like everyone that's kind of prehistoric and it's played from a traditional standpoint. So it's fun. I think it's cool. Like I, I'm, I'm on board with wearing whatever you want, playing whatever music you want uh, and just having a good time because, you know, golf can get pretty stressful, but if you can go out there and have fun, it's just, it's just a good day out. I, I agree. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a it's a good trend line for the game. I think you're also too. I don't know if you noticed this, but like you're, the guys who are getting more into it and stuff, it's like maybe they played other sports. They played soccer growing up, right? But they're 31, and the idea of actually going running for two halves of a soccer game where they already got a bad right ankle just it doesn't sound as appealing as 18 holes of golf with the boys, betting a little bit, having a few cocktails, and you know some some rap music going. It just sounds more fun. And so I think you're getting guys who are athletic who like sport, and now they go down this rabbit hole of this game of golf, and they know they can play it well for the next 25 years, and they're sort of like, that's my next thing. Like a bunch of buddies who played NFL and professional sports or whatever it might be, and like they're obsessed with golf now. Like they're it, just obsessed so, with it. So true. And that's the thing. It's um, you, you, You've hit the nail on the head there. It's, it's guys – getting their competitive outlet and knowing like, obviously, okay, yeah, like I, I might, might have been good at a sport in the past or, a, you know, a high contact sport or like you said, soccer or whatever. And well, I can't really play that because I keep blowing my hamstring out. I'm 35. And, and then they get into golf, which maybe growing up when they were athletes, they're probably like, oh, golf, why would I play that? But then you find that golf is, it, it, it's so addictive because you can see improvement and you can see improvement really quick and it gives you like feedback of how good you are. But then it can also, it can also send you down to the depths of, you know, darkness because of how depressing it can be, like how bad shots you can hit. But then you jump up with the emotion, like you make a birdie and it just draws you back in. So it, it's funny you say that because even a lot of, I, I used to hang out with a couple of Cowboys players and, you know, like NBA players in Dallas and, and they they were obsessed with golf because it's this game that's non-contact. You're not going to really get hurt where you can get a lot of feedback. For, and, and, and you know, the, all these ex-athletes or, you know, guys that were good at sports, they, they need purpose and like an outlet to where they can try to work on something and improve because their whole life they've been driving towards like being good at a sport. And then when that gets taken away, it's like this void and now they're trying to look for something else that where they can, you know, see what, if they can improve that or get better at. And golf's just so perfect because it just gives you so much feedback. And also, there's so many different areas in the game that you can work on. Like you could be great at you could hit bombs, but then have a crappy short game. You could be a great putter, but then you know can't keep it on the planet with the driver. So there's kind of different areas of the game where you can give your buddies shit for like, well. Yeah, good on you, mate. You're a good putter, but I just just blew it by you by thirty yards. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. there's different yeah. areas where you can get good at fast. And yeah, like you, I mean, you obviously you hear all these guys like Romo. Romo's obviously obsessed with golf. Like that guy gets around that. There's a, actually a big game with uh, Romo in Dallas. I'd like to get into it, but I just don't really want to lose the money. But yeah, he I think he. They play like a thousand a hole. You know, sometimes he plays with Zalateros and another kid called Austin Connolly, and and they like they kind of let anyone go play it, and they play for some big cash. But yeah, you get a lot of those. You know, there's a lot of lot of sports stars in Dallas that are they love the game. They're obsessed, even if they're not like amazing at it. They're just they're, it just has another outlet for them after they kind of retire or stop playing sports. I was going to add, this is interesting you brought the Romo thing. Like, I've heard he's really, really good, but then he's not, it's not carrying it over when he goes and plays on like a Corn Ferry Tour event. Do you, any, any thoughts of, you think it's just nerves out of your element of, at his home game, he's a plus three or plus four handicap, and he's kind of like DFL every time he does a Corn Ferry Tour event? Yeah, he's, um, I think by what I just mentioned, because he plays a lot of cash games and like, that, it, it, it is difficult. Um, it's like I even got into this slump where, you know, you go play with your buddies and you play cash games and, 
it's like a wolf game or it's banker or so you're never playing stroke. You, you, it's so rare the time where you turn up with your boys and like, hey, let's just all play uh, best score today for twenty bucks. You know what I mean? Like where yeah. we, we, we've got to put out everything and we've got to we've got to file a stroke score away. It's always like, let's play best ball or. You know, let's have a wolf game where, you know, you, you're in like a couple holes, but then your partner doesn't need you. So I think he might have got a little bit into playing cash games and 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 the fact that he doesn't, you know, because he's, he's a great, he's like a plus two or a plus three. And um, he's a great player. Like he, he'll, you'll go play with him. And, you know, what I've heard is he'll make like an eagle and four or five birdies, but then he'll throw in like three or four dubs and or a triple or something where, you know, you know, if you're getting preparing for a golf tournament and you're going away, that you, you just got to keep that stuff off your card. You got to really learn how to play stroke play instead of like cash game play or game with your boys. So, I think for him, you you occasionally see he'll go play some amateur events. Like he'll play. I think he tried. He qualified for the Western Amateur once, and he'll try to qualify for USAM. And so he, he does try to play some stroke play stuff. But I think that's why his game doesn't really equate to proper events, is because like the event, because the event in um, in uh, the Springfield event that he corn free tour that he played that that's like one of the easiest corn free tour uh, uh, courses. I think the cut there every year is like six under, and it's not like a hard golf course for him to like tee it up at and possibly. Well, making the cuts are always difficult for him, but it's just not it's not like a, a full tournament course that, you know, you'd be thrown into that that he would struggle to break eighty at. So it's just I think for him it's a mindset thing. Um and yeah, pressure. Like, you know, yeah, great. He's a epic quarterback that used to play, but golf's a you know, totally you know, you get billionaires that are scared to hit T shots at pro ams because they got fifteen people watching them. It's so it's one of those things where I think it's a combination of nerves and that he just doesn't play enough stroke play. So it's, uh, I mean, he's, he's a ridiculous athlete. Like he's got this hustle that he does. Um, I heard a pro lost a bit of money to him where he'll play one armed or one handed. So he'll be like, all right, Hey, I'll play. I think you played nine holes. He goes, I'll play nine holes, one armed. And you give me a shot a hole. He, he asked, he gave this bet to a pro. And he whacks this guy. He shot like two over for nine holes with one hand. So it's like he's so he's super athletic. Yeah, yeah, it's super athletic, and he loves the game. I think he, he's he's obsessed with the fundamentals of golf. Like I was on the range one day and I was hitting balls, and this is at uh, TBC Los Colinas where they used to have the Byron Nelson and Romo. I knew who he was, and this was about five six years ago, and he. he he, he was still playing for the Cowboys, but he was injured, so he wasn't allowed to play golf because there was this backlash of um, in Dallas because everyone was like, "Oh, Romo plays so much golf, he doesn't really care about football." Because he was, he was playing like golf like five times a week while he was still quarterback for the Cowboys, and he came. To, so he took some time off and didn't play golf. I think just for the public view. And I remember I was hitting golf balls and. He comes down to the range and he's he's got this guy, you know, probably a buddy with him, but the guy was like 60 years old and they come down and the guy starts like, you know, shelling golf balls and Roma's just standing behind him and he's giving him a lesson. And I'm like, you know, obviously I'm eavesdropping and listening. I was like, listen to what he was talking about, seeing if he knew what he was, uh, knew what the golf swing was. And he's talking about face angle and path and, and, to this, and the, the guy he was coaching may be like a five handicap, and I was like, this guy's really getting into the weeds of the golf swing, uh, you know, given a lesson. So I was like, man, this guy could pass for like a PGA Tour professional, just out, you know, working and and giving lessons. I was like, I was pretty impressed at the knowledge that he had um, of the golf swing. So I think that's that's just the type of guy he is. He just like breaks it down as you hear him when he does his broadcasting. He's just. Yeah. He's yeah. so good at breaking down like active plays. Like, you know, he's he's a perfect ex- example of how I would like to be if I, you know, ever got a full time gig being a broadcaster. Was you know, he just calls it, calls it kind of like he sees it. He he comes from the perspective of like a kid watching the game that's like enjoying it, but then he also you know he's like this mad scientist where he can predict what's happening because he's you know so smart like watching watching football and. 
he'd be perfect as a coach as well. But with the uh, the bag that they gave him at uh, CBS, I think he, he's mm. never going to walk away from broadcasting. Yeah, that's a pretty. He's great at it, and he, I think he's the best. I love his enthusiasm. It feels real. Like I love what he exactly. does on television. He's he's so yeah. good. No, it's um, it shows how hard it is, though. You know, like, and I think I don't know. I think a lot of people get it, but you know realize like just how hard it is to win on any professional tour you take an athlete as good as tony romo and it shows how hard the mental side of it is right and and he's a great athlete and all the rest of it and and he still struggles to make a cut out there not win just to make a cut and as much as he puts into the game and loves it and it's you know it just shows to do it for four rounds and keep your head there and play stroke play golf it's it's really hard it's really, really hard, you know, of, of how, what it takes to win, um, which kind of segments me to my next thing here. I mean, you played all over the world. Um, and my question is, like, obviously, PGA Tour, everyone wants to get to the PGA Tour. But if you had to rate, you know, how hard it is to, to be on those tours or the level of talent or to win on those tours, where would you sort of, you know, put the the rating? Is the European Tour the second hardest tour to play on? Is it... Australasia is it Corn Ferry? Like from we all know, PJ Tour is number one. But you've played all over. Where do you sort of see that sort of pecking order of quality, talent, and difficult to you know difficulty in winning? Yeah, well, that's that's a great question. Actually, it's uh, I haven't played too much on the European Tour. I've played maybe oh, fifteen events, you know, sprinkled over about five years. Um, and a lot of those were co-sanctioned Australia, but I, but I did play a couple in Europe, and then obviously playing. I think I, on and off, I've played on the Corn Ferry Tour for like six, seven years. So you know, based from when I first came to America and played, you know, seven or eight events, and then when I got my card and was exempt for about five years, six years. So um, it's the the way I would say it is like obviously, obviously the PGA Tour is number one, and. Um, but then you get to places like I played a lot in Asia, and Asia is it's not, it's not so much the depth of talent in Asia; it's the fact that it's really hard to beat guys that have played on the Asian tour for you know for a long time. And um, so they, you know, because Asia is very um, the courses are very difficult. You're in different countries. Um, and the same as the European tour, you get on the European tour, you, you play in like 15 different countries, 20 different countries. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you play in America, you can get used primarily. It's just a couple of different states where it's like, all right, we're in Florida this week where the course is super grainy and, you know, but the, the, the rough is dry, but you're going to get flies. And then, you know, you go up northeast and you're like, all right, super quick bank greens. It's going to be firm and fast. It's, you know, beautiful fairways. So, you can kind of get used to the tour on the Corn Ferry and the PGA Tour um, as far as course conditioning goes. But so Europe, Europe's obviously, I think Europe w- would be the second toughest tour just because um, basically, like a lot of European tour events, you pretty much got PGA Tour players playing as well. Like you got guys going back and forwards. Um, the talent up the top in Europe is really good. Uh, weather and course condition is so much different in Europe. Like some week you'll be playing, you know, there'll be polar bears running across the fairways and you can't feel your hands and you, the wind's coming sideways. And then, you know, other weeks you're, you're playing in France and it's like perfect weather. And so it's, um, but Corn Ferry Tour, I would have to say, is so deep. Like Amer- America full stop is getting so deep. There's like an influx of so many guys that are playing that are great. Like even the, the mini tour level over here at, over the last three or four years has gotten so good where to win on the mini, the mini tours, you, you got to shoot 25 to 26 under every week. You have to play four great rounds. Like I remember coming over early days to America and I was playing on the Hooters tour. And I mean, we were going out and partying and drinking and you know, the, it, you just might as well hand the trophy off to every different guy in the field. Yeah, everyone's going to win it one week and, it wasn't as deep and you're having a good time. You're like, this is easy cash. Like we had, we had the other tours were like the e-tours where guys were printing money out there. Now it's like now for to play a mini tour event, there's waiting lists. Everyone's like 
these great college players that are that have just dominated the previous year in their colleges and they're coming out and everyone's playing great golf. So, um, yeah, contrary to it, I think the depth is crazy um, and that's kind of a product of the courses as well. Like, contrary tends to play a lot of easier golf courses. So you put a bunch of good guys on an easy golf course, it's really going to bunch the field. You're not going to get a lot of course separation. And then, um, yeah, European Tour, it's just, European Tour is just, you've got like up, it's really tough to win because up the top you've got still like PGA Tour worthy guys and it's just, you gotta, it's a lot different being in a different country, dealing with the elements and, you know, not being able to adapt to a style of golf in Europe. It's, it's just every week's kind of different. So usually every week you'll see a lot of the locals that tend to play well at their, you know, in their state or their golf course. So, it's really hard to adapt and be like, well, if I can just drive it long this week, but you know, uh, this year, sorry, I can work on that. Or, you know, you, you can't really pinpoint what part of your game you need to really hone in to win consistently on the European tour. So that's why you get a lot of different winners every week. And, and then you tend to see on the PGA tour, the, obviously the same guys winning a lot because they're prodigies and they're the best in the world, but you, you tend to see, you know, not a lot of random guys up the top of the leaderboard. It's you know, yeah, you get good good players, but it's um, a lot easier to to predict the guys that are going to play well in America than you you can in in Europe. So yeah, that's. I mean, you, you also got the Japanese tour that's a really good tour, but it's kind of over there on its own island where you don't get a lot of US guys going over there, and you know, it tends to just be a lot of Aussies and and. Japanese tour players because they they make it hard for foreigners to get on that tour because Q School's like four weeks. But um, yeah, so that's that's kind of it. You, the depth in America is insanely good, and then and then Europe is it's just, it's just difficult because of the the different countries you go in, and, and obviously because so many good players at the top. Well, I saw Q School this year, which uh, you know our buddy Zach Fisher won. It was over, I think it was slightly over a thousand people entered. Stage one this year because it was yeah. backed up for two years. Like a thousand, there's a thousand people who got through pre pre qualifying and coughed up the money, thinking they were good enough to get out there. That talk about depth, right? I mean, that's insanity. There's that many really good players out there just trying to get in the corn ferry tour. And you that's know, it's yeah. Think about that. A thousand guys paying five and a half grand to enter. Plus expenses, so you know if you get through three stages at Q School, you're spending around about ten grand to twelve grand. So you've got guys willing, willing to put that amount of cash up and and back themselves to get through Q School, which is brutal. Like if you ent- if you enter pre qualifying, you've got to get through four stages. Like the percentages on that would be, I don't know, maybe three percent, four percent. So you're like, all right, looks like I'm putting up ten grand or five grand to enter on a on a four percent chance, no matter how good you think you are. And it's brutal. Yeah. And obviously that was also a product of um the European tour cancelling Q school. So I um I I got an opportunity I I went through I got through first stage, but I missed second stage at Q school. So I did some work at um uh, final stage uh, Q school and which I got to actually interview Zach which was awesome and uh, follow him around for a fair few holes and you know get it from a perspective of a broadcaster instead of an actual player but um, and final stage Q school was brutal it was cold it was rainy I was like I <laughs> I said to someone I was like look as much as I would have loved to have been at final stage and got through second stage with the status of my vertebrae in my back there was no way i was getting through that uh abominable snowman weather that they had at final stage so um but yeah it was um so being what i was saying is because they cancelled um uh european tour q school due to covid and you know because it's like the logistics are really tough because obviously you get guys from so many different countries um i think q schools wrapped over like four different countries over there and you got all the influx of those guys coming to America because, you know, these guys want to have somewhere, you know, European tour yeah. players want to have somewhere to play next year. 
There's no Monday qualifying on the European Tour. So it's like you've got all these really good golfers in Europe that might have missed their card, you know, by a couple shots. So really decent golfers. And they're sitting there going, well, I can't play European Tour this year because there's no Q school and there's no Monday qualifiers. So you get all, you've got all these guys coming over to Q school in America. So that was like a comment that I made at final stage. I was like, right, you, do you understand that you've got, it's one of the strongest final stages ever. And this is a, this is back to when you could qualify for the PGA Tour through final stage Q school. Now you can only qualify through the corn, to the Corn Ferry Tour. You've got all these guys coming from Europe that, um, you know, uh, can't play for because they cancelled Q school over there. Like I, I heard um, I was uh, after final stage the Monday after I was having breakfast in my hotel and I heard this South African kid and he was on the phone and he was talking. He was, I think he was having an interview with an agent. So I forget, I forget his name. Um, I think it was Andrew. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm, I'm terrible. That's, I need to get better at that if I want to be able to get on TV broadcasting. But he was, he just missed final stage Q school by a shot. So he finished 53rd, um, which is brutal. You know, like you go from getting eight guaranteed starts to then like, all right, he's probably going to get one or two starts in the first six weeks and then not know. But he was, uh, obviously these agents must have saw some talent in this guy and he's obviously a very good golfer. But he's having a conversation about talking about like sponsorship and who's going to represent him. And I also heard that he's like, all right, I'm going back to South Africa to play the, um, you know, he was going to get starts in the two European tour events in South Africa because obviously he was, you know, one of the better golfers in his country and he was going mm-hmm. to get, he was going to get invites to these two events. So I was just watching TV like a couple of weeks later and I turn on the TV that first event i think it was in Joburg, maybe in south africa and and what do i see old mates holding up the trophy he just went back and he won the european tour event um the first event of the year for that world tour or whatever and i was like gee so this guy came over he did final stage q school he missed by a shot but he's also talking like you know i really want to come over and play a full schedule in america because i want to try you know I, i i don't have a card in europe anymore and bam, he goes back, wins the first event of the year, European Tour event. Now he's exempt through, he'll be back on European Tour. And it just shows like the quality of golfers. This guy's like come over, gone through all the Q school stages, missed out by it, Corn Ferry Tour School by one, gone back to, you know, South Africa for the Coast Sanctioned European Tour event, wins that. Like that's the quality of guys you've got coming to America now. And and um, it's just going to get stronger and stronger, especially with all these kids coming out of college that are just ready to win. It's it's pretty insane, like how how where golf is right now and how strong it's going to be in like the next couple of years, and like the depth is going to be crazy. I, I agree, and like you know, with, with, with Zach winning and, and and doing it, and I was having you're, you're saying the same conversation I had with. Uh, TA3 or Tommy over the third and Tommy watches a lot of golf still and he was you know saw the amount of players in and he goes you know I've won on the PGA Tour multiple times he's like do you know how blank and hard it is to win that event with Zach won like he was even blown away of like he knows the level of competition he's like that is insanely difficult to win that Q school this year insane he's like I never won it he's like there's a thousand people who can play in that thing he was like just telling me like the admiration he had for Zach for how hard that event would be to actually win. And that's coming from a guy who played the PGA Tour for 28 years or something crazy, like 650 events. Oh, um, it's, yeah, it's it's brutal. Like, I mean, I I did well at Final Stage Q School once in my life. and um, But I was lucky because I played well in Australia and I was exempt through to the final stage of Q School. So I didn't have to go through the grueling, you know, back then it was when you could qualify straight onto the PGA Tour. Um, and so my goal was when I, this was 2008, my goal was just to get uh, back the Nationwide Tour card. And I turned up and this is when it was six rounds and I shot nine under in the first round and I went straight to the top of the leaderboard and I was like, oh shit. So now instead of my goal of finishing top, 75 back then it was to you know get your nationwide tour card i was like oh now i'm like trying to get on the pga tour and it was the most stressful six days of my life because as a golfer 
And even when I interviewed Zach at final stage, I interviewed him after the third round. So he was, after the third round, he was leading the tournament by two, but he was maybe, he was eight shots in, uh, he was eight shots inside the number. So mm-hmm. everyone's thinking, oh yeah, cool. He's eight shots inside the number. But I, and, but as a goal, and like I did when I was in, I was at final stage, it, you think you, you already know what going to bed at night, what you can shoot to, to make, to keep the card. Like you're like, all right, if I like, so Zach, even though he was so confident, it's like, you know, like, all right, if I don't shoot eight over tomorrow, I'm going to get a full card. But, and it's, the fact is that at a high level, like you're leading something like that, where you've got all these people around the world that are trying to play. It's like one of the toughest events in the world. It's then you've got to snap out of it. And you've got to be like, hang on. I'm playing so good. I'm leading this tournament. There's no way I'm going to shoot that score. If anything, I'm going to actually go the other way and probably win by three or four. So it's, it's so tough. Like I think, and what I was going to get to is like when I did final stage, I played with a guy called Harrison Frazier. He, he ended up winning twice on tour, had really tough, like injuries. I think he had like hip hop, double hip operation. Yeah. Yeah. He was always injured, but a hell of a talent. I mean, he was a ball striking Jesse. Well, and that's the thing. In the in the fifth round, I played with him. He missed a four footer on the last hole, right? He missed a four footer on the last for fifty eight. So I'm playing with him. This is Q school. This is the. It was a fourth round, so we had two more to go after this. The dude shoots fifty nine, <laughs> and and I'm running second. I'm twelve shots behind or ten shots behind him. So then I play with him in the last round. So he's leading, whatever, we tee, we tee it up. I'm running second, uh, playing with David Fathauer, and he's he's beating us by seven shots. He then birdies seven of the first nine holes. He's leading by like 15, and I turn, I remember I turned to him, and I go, dude, can you just step off the gas a little bit, mate? You've got it. It's fine. But that's just the crazy talent that Q School brings out. This guy won by... Like, you know, because the reason, sorry, I digress on this because you said Tommy Armour said it's so hard to win final stage and then Zach won final stage, it's so hard to win it. And then you've got you've got this guy that won by like 15 back when it was like getting you on the PGA Tour. And it was just incredible stuff. It was like one of the greatest things I've ever seen. So when I went to final stage and I was like following Zach and stuff, and the reason I told people like on the telecast when that it was one of the toughest tournaments in the world and like tougher than tour events is because you could be running 40th and if you're in a tour event and you're running 40th you don't give a shit you're like whatever i'm booking my flights where am i staying next week you know 40th yeah there's a little bit of money on the line but also the guy running 60th at final stage q school he's like pumping so hard just to try to get into 40th it's like most events the guy running 60th he's on he's just made the cut he's over it he's trying to play the quickest fourth round of his life but at Q School, you got guys that are running 50th, 60th, 70th that still think they have a chance of getting in the top 40 to get their card. So they're still trying really hard, even though it's like a fourth round and they're not close to the lead. So that's why what I personally think that makes Q School so tough is that you've got so many guys that never give up. They never like turn off. They're always like engaged, and it's that's from like the 70th all the way to the first where. Also for Zach, it was so big for him to win because he'd been struggling with cash for like yeah. three or four years. Yeah. You know, like everyone's right. like, oh, great. He's got his eight events. He's going to be set. I'm like, people don't understand that the Corn Ferry Tour, it's, you don't get it, go up, walk off that tour a millionaire. Like it's still, his first eight weeks on that tour are going to be super expensive. Like pretty sure you drop twenty to 30,000 in travel expenses over those first like six to eight weeks because you're yep. playing in the Bahamas, you, you know, you're flying everywhere tournaments don't run in together you can't drive to nothing so the fact that he won q school and won 50 grand it's like so good for him to where he's like i can schedule out my first like three to four months on the tour don't have to worry about cash and then in turn like i text him after it all and i was like dude go out and like you know you've been on corn Ferry tour so many other years i was like you're playing so good go win like stop messing around with like don't think about keeping your card. Don't do all that sort of stuff. So go win and get on tour next year. So you've got the talent. You've got a bit of cash in the bank. And he was like, yeah, cool. You know, I'm looking forward to it. So it's pretty. it was pretty awesome watching him play at Q School um, and play so confidently. Like the way he played was like, 
sort of tour caliber. So I was I was pretty pretty excited for him, and uh, yeah, it was obviously a good event for him. Yeah, I mean for us too, right? Like if you would have told me we would, you know, I would found you know be the founder and start this company, and we would even be, I never I never could have dreamed we would have a guy, you know, essentially win a corn, I'll call it like a win on the corn ferry tour event. Like I was so like happy for him first, right? Like just to accomplish what he's accomplished and for us yeah, to just be yeah. a little part of that team, just because I know he could play any club. He's that talented, but yeah, yeah. for us to do it too, it's like, I'll, I don't have the talent to play professional golf. I'm not that good. So this is as close as I'll ever sniff it of being, you know, somewhat involved in it. And it's just the pride we had and so happy for him on a personal level. He stayed at our house and we've gotten to be good friends and, and we just know their family really well and they're such good people. And then for him to have that place now to show his talents off and he's playing so good. Um, it's going to be fun. And just for our little company to have a little spot in that, just to kind of go, holy shit, we, you know, our stuff is being played at the highest level and performing. It's just such a cool feeling. Like I'm, it, we, you know, it was such a cool thing to watch that whole thing happen and and to see what he did with it. And like I said, I firmly believe he could have won with any club out there. But you know, we're fortunate he chooses to play our stuff. And you know, we just have a we're a little tool in the toolbox, is what I like to say. So it was fun, man. It's it's cool to see it, and I think he's going to do really well next year. I really do. And um, it couldn't happen to a better guy on top of it. He's a, he's a good man. And that's and that's great for you guys too, because yeah, it. Of course, he could play other stuff, but he doesn't. He chooses to play. You know, you guys. I've I've seen your stuff. It's it's awesome, and you got to start somewhere because every every company started somewhere. But it it must be pretty cool for you to not only have you know because Zach's a really good bloke, and you know you not only have like a friend that you've gotten to know, but he, he you know him playing your stuff. It's kind of like you're also being like one of your little babies. He, you know, you're playing vicariously through your equipment when mm-hmm. when people use it and play well with it. So the fact that, you know, you, you've gotten to know him through that, but then you also, you know, as I said, he's not going to play your stuff if it's not good. And that's it must be really cool for you to be like, you know what, I've got, we got the confidence, the company's got the confidence where we can we can have players use it at the highest level and then you also have him where he's such a great bloke. You've gotten to know him. So it's kind of like part, you put, you're both part of a team and it's, it's great. It's like seeing a, you know, it's like seeing a, like a kid grow up, your kid grow up and do well at sports where you're like, Oh, you know what? I mean, I suppose you could say you're like, Oh, I created that little fella and I kind of guided him and all her and, you know, into what they've become and, you know, so it's, yeah, that, that's obviously a cool scenario for you guys. Well, the, yeah. yeah, then for us too, you know, the iron, I'm not trying to do a podcast of just talking about our stuff. We don't normally do it, but the cool backstory is, you know, t- TA3 helped us design that iron that Zach won with. So oh, perfect, you have Tom, Tommy, I mean, spent a year and a half of getting this, you know, player's iron exactly the way he wanted it. So then you have this cool backstory of one of my heroes growing up who's working on the project. It's a sub-70 TA3 club. And then Tommy puts all this time and effort to co-brand it with us. And then now the younger generation, right, Zach wins with it. So it's such a cool that Tommy's hands were so involved in this project and not just him looking at it and say, sure, put my name on it, but him yeah. literally beating balls with this and telling me it's not good enough yet, fix it, and here's what I want done to where it got done and then seeing it win. That was just the most satisfying thing of the whole thing too, of generational chain, you know, Tommy, who has been such a great player for such a long time. And it was so generous to us, you know, to come on board and help us design this with, with his influence. And it's, you know, a lot of the good players like the club. And then to see Zach win with it was just a cool, I just kind of sat back and smiled and went, I, I how did, how the hell did we get here? It's just amazing. And Tommy's, He's really good with that stuff. He's really a gearhead, and he's very, very intelligent. He's got so much tour experience. He just knows what he kind of wants, and then these guys are kind of trusting that what he puts his name on for that you know elite player, it works. Well, and and it helps that Tommy's one of the best ball strikers of all time. So yeah. the fact he got a guy that's one of the best ball strikers slash iron players that's ever been on a golf course designing your iron. That's as far as an endorsement goes. It doesn't really get much better than that. So 
that that helps like as a play, player perspective when you hear that like I didn't even know that so when you hear that you're like oh sweet that that just means that you know you you can trust something that's been you produced by someone that knows what they're doing especially physically when it comes to like how good of a player and ball striker he was I was just out in Vegas last week with him he's 62 and I'm telling you his ball striking still is fantastic with everything like he is a ball he hits it I mean easily you know his, his schedule is slowing down a little bit but man can he still hit a golf ball yeah uh, yeah he's he hasn't lost it yet you know he works at it hard but just a different sound man like even from a good amateur player right it's just you just watch him pound irons and just the sound and the way it comes off and you're right he can still really I mean he's a great ball striker and has been for years so it was fun to still watch him play he's still I would call it. He's still stupid good. It's still yeah right. Yeah yeah. I tell you, I mean he he can send it in the in the bars as well. I I might have had a couple of ales with him <laughs> over the over the years, and uh, yeah, he uh, he can still 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 out out drink it. some of us young bucks. That's for sure. So he is he, a legend. Uh, he exactly he 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 sends it hard in all facets of life, golf. It, Everything. <laughs> he is fun to go out with. I'll leave it at that. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but we yeah. had a good time hanging out for three days. I'll put it to you that way. Well, He's a good guy. I'm surprised you made it back. Three days in Vegas, and then you add a, a legend like Tommy Armour. Is, uh, that's uh, that's next level. So, Well, I, I recovered for a couple of days, but uh, it was well worth it. We had a great trip out there. Um, yeah, but speaking of cool. some legends, I was going to bring this up as well. The guys you grew up playing with, it's, you know, I was looking at that, like Price, you know, Jared Lyle, Buckle, Leishman. I mean, your generation that came out of Australia, how competitive was that? Like, what did you learn from playing with those guys? I mean, I think Adam Scott might have just been a little bit older, mm -hmm. but you guys had some, I mean, world-class players you guys grew up with in that generation playing against each other, and it had to make you a better player, I'd have to imagine. Oh, for sure. I definitely wouldn't. If we didn't have that kind of competitive atmosphere in Australia, I probably wouldn't have made it on tour. Like it just, um, yeah. So before, like a couple of years before my time, we're talking guys like um, Adam Scott, Aaron Baddeley, Matt Jones. Um, and then, uh, then you've got the guys that were like a year or two, like Jason Day was like, I remember playing golf with Jason Day. I was 18. And he was like 13. And I remember someone saying, oh, this kid, he's going to be something special. And I was like, oh, cool. All right. And I was like, I met him. And he's like really quiet and young, kind of, you know, fidgety, but motivated little junior. He was, he was playing off plus five when he was 13. And this is That's back insane. when they are. Uh, yeah, like this, is, this wasn't the like makeshift dodgy handicap that's around now where you can shoot three good rounds and discard 45 of them and, you know, just keep that score. This is when it was like plus five was what you averaged. Like this was, you know, you, whatever score you put in, that was it. That's how it was back then. And so I was like, all right, okay. And then playing with him, I was like, this, this kid's going to be something special. And then the guys I grew up with, um, so I roomed with Aaron Price and, um, at, at a thing we call in Australia called the, the Australian Institute of Sport. And um, Pricey, mate, I think Pricey, mate, he was a winner on the Corn Ferry Tour. He won. He played like three or four years on PGA Tour. Um, and then you got guys like, yeah, Jared Lyle, Michael Sim. Um, you know, obviously Jared Lyle and Michael Sim both played on tour. Like Sim, Sim, he had to withdraw from the Masters because he had an injury. Um and he's still he's still going all right. But then you got guys like I played Leishman was another guy that was I was on the um, the uh, Eisenhower team with. Who Leishman was kind of like that amateur golfer where we're all growing up. That was you know nothing, not special. Like he was good, like but he was never in like the top five guys kind of consistently in all the selected events. And and then he was. He just, as soon as he turned pro and he just went to a different level, um, obviously. And then you got guys like Andrew Buckle, who was an absolute prodigy. Like when I was 16 and playing with him, he was he just could do things with a golf ball that 
only tour players could do as a 16 year old. I was like this guy, you know, like I would, I was this little junior that had like a swing, like an octopus falling out of a tree. And I just skank it around and like score and do that sort of stuff. But playing with him and, and another guy called Stephen Bowditch, obviously Bowdo won twice on tour. Those two guys growing up were next level where I was like, all right, this, you know, they're the same age as, you know, I'm, I'm six months older than these guys, but I know that I'm not as good as them. Like, and well, it was funny because I'd always beat Buckle in competitive events when I played against him, but I'd just get lucky and like make putts and, you know, do little just sort of chippy stuff. But yeah, so I, I'm probably missing a couple guys that I've forgot, but, and then it, I don't know what it is with Australia and, and New Zealand and just producing these, like, I think it's because Australia is such a, a sporting country and, you know, we've got pretty good weather and it just that competitive atmosphere. And, but yeah, but I mean, we've got 20 million people in Australia and they we've churned out this ridiculous amount of like quality golfers. And, um, you know, now you've got another, there's more Australian, you know, Lucas Herbert just got on tour. You've got Cam Smith. that's like going to just, he's going to, once he wins once, he's just going to, you know, in a in a big event or a single event, he's just going to keep going on with it. It's it's really incredible, and yeah, for me personally, growing up with these guys, it um, yeah definitely made helped me with my career getting on tour and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I was looking, I was like, good lord, he was playing in a, it looked like a PGA Tour event of the level of competition you were playing against as an amateur for those guys growing up. And I was like, I said, doing some backdrop work on this, I was like, whoa, I mean, that's that's a tour event right there. You know, the odds of all those guys being that good from the amateur level, it was, it's pretty remarkable um, of the competition you grew up with. It was like, yep, know that name, yep, know that name, yep, all right, all right, yep. That was, uh, that was pretty cool to see. And like I said, to, to see, you know, all of you guys at some point in time played the PGA Tour and had to make you better, you know, you play against that level of talent, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we're like, just quickly, like when I think our national squad had like 15 to 20 guys on it, like the national squad, it's it's kind of like the squad that, you know, you travel around in Australia, you, you're kind of sponsored by Australian golf and not really, but you go compete for all the amateur events in Australia. And I think from that specific squad, like out of 15 dudes, I think like seven made it on tour. So the fact that you got like a 50% chance from a year of it is ridiculous. Like now looking back, it's like, I can't believe how much, like I'm missing out like 10 guys that I grew up playing with from Australia that made it on tour, like in my era. So it's like, it's just incredible. Yeah. Like the, the fact that, you know, how, how small the country is and how many guys made it on the PGA tour is like insane. Well, final question I got for you. I think I know what the answer is going to be, but I kind of want to hear why is the sand belt in Australia the best golf architecture in the world? And if you do think it is from an overall region, what makes that area so special for golf? Well, obviously I'm biased, but yes. the For me personally, the collection of golf courses in the sand belt um, is, it's not even close at how much, you know, like, yes, around the world, there's like one or two courses in a collection area, but this, I mean, you've got, 10 golf courses within a 10 mile radius that could all be ranked in the easily in the top hundred in the world. Like it just, it is insane. And, and yes, I'm biased, but I'm actually from Sydney. So it's kind of like, you know, like I'm giving Victoria their props for having these amazing golf courses. And it's, it's like even the state of Victoria, like you can go an hour away and, Pay pay fifteen dollars and play another epic golf, like epic golf courses. Like it's just, it's something. Now, built, obviously, the the word sand belt. It's like I think that's just like a secret in how to build a really good golf course that can have great drainage and great land um, and architecture in that area of that of, of Australia. And it's just sand belt golf or, or the golf that's in Melbourne is, is just so good because it's like you get a bit of everything out of like so it'll be just like america all right you get a bit of florida you get a bit of northeast you get you know a bit of a bit of coastal stuff a bit of everything and 
the thing that's so great, it's, you know, the weather helps it in Melbourne. It's, you know, they don't, it gets cold there, but it's not like it snows or anything. And then, you know, like, yes, summer gets hot, but then in the middle of summer, you can have like perfect three or four perfect days a week where it's not too bad. And it's like, it's not Lynx golf because, you know, typically Lynx golf is, is played in horrendous conditions and, there's no links golf is like a lot of a lot of greens that kind of fairway runs into green that's why you can use the ground a lot in links golf and no real like there's not crazy runoffs in links golf but what what it is with sandbelt golf and you know places like Royal Melbourne and Kingston Heath and it's like you've got these really firm fast greens like I see I think some of the US team when the right the President's Cup were down there were complaining it because they had the greens at like 14 at Royal Melbourne and you get these, they're raised. So if you, let's just say, you you know, go off the back of the green, you could end up having like a 40-yard pitch shot. But the the, the green is so elevated, you, you can't see the bottom of the pin. You've, you've got this dome of a golf green. So now you're, you've been offered with like four different subset of golf shots you can hit. You can putt it, you can bump and run it, you can hit the flop shot, you know, you can you, you can hit a, a shot into the bank and bounce it up. So it's kind of like you've got all these options, but it's if you short side yourself, you just you're just done. So typically, you know, in America, if you you run off the back of a green, you're going to catch rough or fringe and and have like a short pitch shot out of rough, like to like a like a pin that's like three yards away, and or bunker. A lot of bunkers in America, like a, the ball tends to stay in you know, on the upslope or in the lip or, you know, in Australia, what happens is the bunkers are cut so sharply close to the green. You'll hit it in a bunker and like, just say you short side yourself, the ball tends to always run to the center of the bunker. And now you've like, all right, I've, I've got this elevated bunker shot off this firm because the sand always tends to be firm and fast. And now I've got to hit this shot. And it's just bunker straight to green. So the pin, let's just say there could be a pin that's on like 10 feet. So you're like, all right, somehow I've got to get this up and stop this quick. Like, But you, you're hitting to an elevated green off a flat lie, typically. So it's not like, you know, sometimes you hit into a bunker in the States or and it's in the upslope and you're like, oh, this is easy. You know, I, you know I'm going to use the slope. But it, it just links golf. It, it, oh, sorry, sorry, sandbelt golf. It's I, The thing I love... so the most is how firm the greens, you know, the greens are in Melbourne. Like I think I hit a shot once I had 80 yards and the pin was back, right. So, you know, maybe 30 paces on five from the back, five from the right. So I hit a sand wedge and it skipped six times before it checked. So, you know, I had to land this 20 yards short of the hole because the green was so firm and fast but it, it's just skidding all the way to the back and then checks and then releases out a little bit towards the pin. So I think if you watched any of the President's Cup at Royal Melbourne when uh, Tiger just put on a clinic, he just, you, you could see he never took it straight at pins. He always was conservative. And then you saw a lot of like, uh, you know, US killed Australia because it's their talent that they just killed the, uh, the, 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 the other team, the the international, sorry, um, because they're just so good. But you could see there's a lot of US guys that tend to play a lot, like a lot more aggressive that found themselves in frustrating positions because it's like you just can't overpower a golf course in, in the sand belt. It's just you really got to play strategic and really good at the same time. Like it's not like, oh, yeah, I'm playing safe and shooting away from a pin. You're like, I actually have to, I have to, hit a great golf shot here conservatively just to hit it like 15 feet. So it's, um, it's just a different style of golf. That's that I, I love and, and I, Hey, I love America. I've lived here for a long time and I love golf here, but it, it just, it's just a totally different kind of outlook down in Australia and especially down on those, the best, those best courses like Royal Melbourne and down in the sand belt. I loved watching it. I love the strategy of angles and the shots and the thinking that went on versus just bomb it, hit it. I, I, it's so amazing 
And I love Golden Age architecture, if it's Seth Rayner or whatever it might be. is like, I don't know what was in the whiskey or the water in those Golden Age eras, but the, the courses still stand up today. And the strategy in which those masters could design a golf course is just brilliant. You know, you can play Chicago Golf Club, it's the same way, where, you know, C.B. McDonald, Seth Rayner, and the green complexes, and what do you do with it? And you can't just take it straight on, and it's just brilliant, right? And these courses hold up 100 years later, and they still, you know, you probably never quite master it, right? Because I've heard if you play Royal Melbourne, you know, it's going to take you a couple times to kind of figure out where's the angle and where, you know, based on your level, skill set level, which tee shot do you hit here and which position do you want it to be in for your second shot? And it's just, I've heard it's just never been to the area, but people say it may be the best golf course in the world. And that's the thing. It, what what a good architect will do is like Royal Melbourne, it makes you play the course how it was designed. So it's, you know, there's a lot of golf in America where you're like, all right, I'm, I'm playing this golf course, but you know what? I'm just going to bomb it over those trees and just not, I don't need to hit it up the fairway or whatever because I can hit it over that right side because I can hit it far enough now. But you, you still can't really do that on on the courses in the sand belt where it makes you play the hole how the architect, the architect wanted you to play the hole. Because if you don't, you if you watch President's Cup and you you got overly aggressive on a hole you're just you're just done you just cannot get get at any of the pins you it you know it just it's great in the way that it you know it doesn't have to be a long golf course you can play off the tee three or four different ways um and still like you know like you could be the guy that hits an iron off a goal off a hole and a guy the guy that hits a driver in the fairway could be too close to the green and and this is something that doesn't you know, you, you, you talk about guys that use that decade app and everything. There's only one kind of place in the world that that pushes that app to the limits where, you know, like Bryson, a guy that you would use strokes gained and, you know, being closer to a hole is is the epitome of every kind of, you know, dry, if, a, if you can hit a driver 30 yards short of a green, it's way better than hitting an iron and having a wedge in, but there's only one right. place in the world that contradicts that and it's like a place like Royal Melbourne where if you've got a front pin and you're 40 yards there's no way you know you can get that golf shot within 50 feet there's because you can't generate enough spin the there'll be a runoff at the front there's just it, it there's no way so you it's the only place where I love decade and I love all the, the the strokes game math but it's it's the only place like in the world where you're like, all right, I actually need a decent yardage here so I can generate some spin to where the ball's not going to bounce four or five times before it stops, you know. So it's – and and, and then the, just quickly, the the other thing that I love about Sandbelt Golf is there's so many short, great golf holes. Like uh, there's, there's holes where you you, are, you could hit like a two-iron on the green on a par four, but it could be so penalizing if you like go over the back or miss it left. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of decision-making – on short golf holes where you, you don't really get that in America. It's like, there's not a lot of short par fours that are really difficult, you know, like it's oh, hit it as hard as you can and find it and wedge it on. I mean, for the most part, right? exactly. And that's why, yeah. you know, that's why all the commentators go nuts at Riviera over the 10th hole. Like it, it, it's like one of the most talked about like short par fours in America. It's, and it's a great hole, I, I, but they you know, you look at all these guys and so many different decisions made on that hole. And so many guys make double by hitting driver next to it or three wood in the front trap or, you know, and then you've got the guys that lay up. So it, it, you get a lot of that in Australia where you could, you know, you using an example of the tent at Riviera where, but there will be no rough around it. So it's kind of really tight green, small green, but you could, you could miss the green by like three feet and have like a 40 yard sort of pitch shot where you, you dead, you can't even get it close, you know? So it, there's a lot of like in the sand belt. There's a lot of like really short par fours and short par threes that that are like the toughest holes on the golf course. You know, instead of just being like, all right, we're playing a five fifty yard par four, just send it and then try to get a good six on. You know what I mean? Like it, it's just, oh yeah, that's what I love about it, and that's and, no shock why Tiger played great, right? Just thinking his way around there and being Tiger Woods, right? I'm oh, and, I mean, and Tiger's the best in saying that he's like he's his number one quote that I always took away was people would say, Yo, you're an aggressive golfer, aren't you? And he goes, well, no, 
he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm really aggressive to my conservative targets. And that was one of the best like tips that I even learned where I was like, and that's so smart. He chooses his target conservatively and, but he's never like, you know, you get over a shot and you're like, Oh, I have to aim like five yards away from this hole. But as me personally, like sometimes I'll be like, yeah, but I really want to hit it close and make birdie. So you kind of pull it back on the pin or, and hit it in the water. And, but he was, he is one of the best at being like, Nope, that's, that's my target. And that's where I'm hitting it. You know? So that was, that was yeah, pretty it was, cool. Well, I have to get over there when all this COVID shit ends at some point in my life and get over there and play the, the sand belt area. I'm such a, I love great golf architecture and it's got it. It's on my bucket list to get over there at some point in time to do it. So we'll let everything settle down and, uh, hopefully the next four or five years for my skill set goes to total hell in a hand basket and get over there and play a little bit. It'd be a wonderful <laughs> trip to do. So, Hey man, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, thanks, you know, for taking the time to do this really, really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we'd love to have you on again sometime, you know, maybe as the, the season's progressing and give your thoughts on what you're kind of seeing out there and be fun watching you play a little bit and doing some broadcasting. So look forward to kind of watching your journey in 2022. Sounds great. And yeah, I had a so I rambled on a little bit, but I had a great time and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun and, and keep up the good work and, and, uh, I look forward to seeing, uh, sub 70 and uh, a lot more of, uh, golfers hands. Appreciate it.